Welcome everyone one more time. And as you know, uh, we are here to, to explore some very interesting uh, uh, findings. I wouldn't even call them findings, but some very interesting observations as yet. Uh, and uh, as you all know, snow leopards have long been classified as one of the uh, most elusive and least studied species. It's only thanks to technology that we've managed to bridge uh, the gap in knowledge about uh, the species and its ecology, especially behavioral ecology over the last uh, maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, so the long-term ecological study in Tost in South Gobi, Mongolia, uh, it just completed its 15 years this spring and having collared 35 snow leopards, including 20 males and 15 females, and monitoring many of them over several years, uh, plus photographing snow leopards on more than 2,000 occasions, the lessons that are still being learned every day. And the, at this point in time, our team's collaring snow leopards with the, uh, which have a two-way communication facility that makes it possible for the scientists to change the periodicity at which uh, these callers record and uplink data, which allows them to intensively monitor them for, a sh for shorter periods of time and then let them continue over a, uh, over a regular pace to ex maximize and extend the battery life. So the context about the, the, uh, the discussion today is that when three, three, four months ago, when our team was in the Toast Mountains, they recorded something extraordinary. Uh, they, they were literally on the snow leopard's tail, uh, giving enough time so that the animals don't get disturbed, but not enough time that you lose the, uh, the crucial clues that the snow leopards leave behind. And they have received some fascinating insights about these cats that have mesmerized, uh, not just those who, um, who were not there, but even those who were very much there. So today I'm very happy to introduce to you two eminent scientists, Dr. Gustav Samilius. He serves as the Assistant Director of Science uh, at the Snow Leopard Trust and has an extensive experience of working on snow leopards, lynxes and foxes for over 30 years. Uh, we also have Dr. Yan Lin Liu from the College of Life Sciences at the Qinghai Chin Normal University. Uh, he has been working with different teams on uh, snow leopard assessments in the uh, Chilean, uh, Chilean Shan Mountains. Uh, he serves as the lecturer in the college. And uh, in the past, he has served as the director of the snow leopard project uh, for the Shan Shui Conservation Center. Uh, in fact, the commonality between the two eminent people we have here is that both are at the heart of uh, telemetry-based studies on snow leopards. And the distance between these two studies is roughly uh, they're, they're roughly one snow leopard distance away from each other. So the Thos study and the study that uh, Yandin's leading, they're not very far. They're just about 500 kilometers apart. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop coming in between you all and these uh, our, our speakers today. Just a few logist, uh, housekeeping notes, please. If you have any questions, put them in the chat window. We will open the conversation for a discussion after both the presentations are done. And just to reiterate, we are live on YouTube today. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Gustav. Hey, well, thank you, Gustav, for that introduction. And hi, everyone. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces and names and um, some, some uh, new names as well. So yeah, uh, welcome everyone. We're gonna talk about cluster studies, uh, what they are and what we can learn from them. And uh, before I start, I just wanna say that, okay, sorry, I'm gonna make a little change here. Okay, that, that's good. Uh, before I start, I just wanna say that uh, what I'm gonna share with you here today is of course, um, uh, the results of the work by many people. So <clears throat> obviously not just by me, but many people, Kustu being one of them, um, and uh, the work of two organizations, Snow Leopard Trust and Snow Leopard Conservation Foundation in Mongolia. So a collaborative work where I'm just one of the cogs in this, in this big wheel of uh, collecting this data. 
let's see if this is going to work. Okay. There we go. Okay, and also before we start, I want to uh, just share an outline for the talk so you know roughly what to expect. And I think I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes or thereabouts. Um, <clears throat> so start with a little bit of a background or introduction, you could say, what are cluster studies and what we can learn from them. Then the middle section, that's going to be sort of the meat of the presentation. <clears throat> and sorry, and in that um, um, part, I'm going to give you some examples of what we have learned from cluster studies then in the Taos Mountains in Southern Mongolia. And then we're going to finish with uh, discussions and, and questions. Okay, so what are clusters then? Well, I'm going to try and illustrate this with a hypothetical movement track of an animal. So the green line that you see on the screen now, that is a hypothetical movement track of an animal. And Almost always, if you have animals moving through space, there are going to be certain uh, places or certain uh, spaces or <laughs> certain places where they will either stop or they will return to. And if you have a collar on that animal, you will get a clustering or a collection of GPS points at these specific places where they stop and where they return to. So a cluster then is simply a place where a collared animal stops or returns to. So it, it requires that we have a collar on the animal. And also it's a methodological or a technical thing. It's not a biological concept per se, uh, but we can use these technical or methodological things to look at different behaviors. That's the thing. But again, as Kostub said, it requires a collar on the animal. So it's a technical thing that we can study by having collars on the, on the animals. Um, but we can use it to study a lot of different behaviors then. One obvious question, at least to me then, is why do animals stop at certain places? So why do they return to these places? Well, of course, because there's something there that either attracts them or is important to them. That's why they're either then stopping or returning to, to these places. And often this is related to three very basic things that virtually all animals have to look after. And that is to find enough food to survive. They have to avoid being killed or, or um, injured by other animals. And they also have to find a mate and reproduce. So these three basic things is something that virtually all animals have to uh, look after. And it also leads to clustering of the places where they are them returning to specific places or staying at specific places. What then can we learn from the clusters? Well, I've hinted at these sort of three basic needs that animals have to look after. And if we think about carnivores, carnivores, they tend to kill big prey. And if you kill a big prey, you're likely going to stay at that prey for quite a while because it takes quite, quite a while to consume them. And then if we have a collar, we're going to find a clustering, clustering of positions at that very kill site, either by the animal just staying right there or going back and forth. So that will result then in a clustering or a collection of GPS points at the kills. And then we can use that to, to look at various things. And for carnivores, by far the main um, thing that people have looked at when it comes to clusters are predation patterns. So looking at things at what are they killing, how often are they killing, uh, how long are they staying at these places, where are these places located, these type of questions you can, can ask. And those, like I said, are the most common things that people have looked at when it comes to clusters. But there are other uh, behaviors we can look at um, when it comes to clusters. And uh, sorry, I'm just gonna wait one more change here on the screen, it looks strange. Uh, um, there are other behaviors we can look at uh, from clusters. So, uh, for example, reproductive behaviors. Let's say you have an animal like the fox on the picture there that's using a dense site, or it could even be a bird using a, um, a nest or an animal <clears throat> having their young in a specific place. If the, you then have a collar on it, it's, of course, it's going to go back and forth to this place where it's uh, having its young, and that's going to result in a cluster. So we're going to get a, a cluster of positions at, at that space as well. And we can, similarly to before, use that to look at certain behaviors like uh, timing of reproduction, uh, how far are they going from their breeding um, sites, how often are they going back and forth, or how often do they leave their young alone? These kind of questions we can also look at. Now, 
breeding is going to take it takes place over a much longer time period than um, what what um, feeding on a on a kill or feeding on a prey does. And one very important thing when you're working with clusters are that you have to adjust that period that Kostum was talking about between your GPS uh, location. So how you program your callers to take, how frequent you program to take a position is gonna be re related to the type of behavior that you study. So if you have a, a behavior that's occurring over a long, long time period, you can take uh, positions less frequently. And for those of you that work with, with uh, callers, you know that uh, there's always a balance of trying to get frequent positions and trying to get the collar to last as long as possible. So we're always trying to find that optimal uh, positioning rate that will allow us to answer the questions that we're interested in, but also follow the animal over as long time as possible. So that's sort of the balance or trade-off for virtually all collar, collar study. And that's true for clusters. You have to adjust uh, the positioning rate to the behavior they're looking at. Um, another thing that I find is quite interesting with animals that are using a den or perhaps a, a cave or something like this to, to have their young is that when they're in that uh, den or in that cave, they're actually going to disappear or the, the collar is going to lose contact with the satellite. So it, all of a sudden, when they go into that den, if they're in there for extended time, they're gone or they, they, we lose contact with, their, with the collar. <clears throat> and that uh, can be seen as problematic, but you can also turn it around and say, okay, can we use that somehow? And what people have done then is that when for denning animals, when they go in the den and uh, disappear, if you say, uh, for extended periods, you can use that to identify when they're breeding. So you can look at timing of breeding and how long they're in the dens. Uh, so you can actually use that to your advantage as well. So that's uh, reproductive behaviors. We can uh, okay, sorry. There. We can also um, uh, look at um, or use clusters to look at resting behaviors. And I think resting behaviors is something that uh, there has not been a lot of work done at resting behaviors, but all animals need to rest and all animals have to avoid to get killed or injured or virtually all animals. There may be some animals that don't have to worry about it, but virtually all animals also have to uh, avoid getting injured or killed by others. And when you rest, you tend to have a uh, lower, um, you, you tend to, to, to not be as alert as other times. So it's likely important that you find safe places when you're, when you're resting. So if you look at the raccoon on the picture there, for example, I mean, it definitely looks very relaxed, but it's probably also very safe in this home. <clears throat> a few animals can probably get to it. A few animals can get through that little hole where it's uh, resting. Um, so uh, resting behaviors is another thing. And why? Because there is, they stand often when you rest, you rent, rest for extended period. So again, you will have a clustering or positioning right where you are at. Okay, so that's um, examples of what we can learn from clusters. So now we're gonna jump into the more fun part, I think at least, and that is what have we learned from clusters? And by me, uh, by us, then it's, it's Snow Leopard Trust and Snow Leopard Conservation Foundation in Southern Mongolia. And I'm gonna start to show you some summer data of what we have found. And it's gonna be a little bit of a, yeah, just a, a little mix of uh, different findings from, from different studies that I'm going to share with you in, in, a, in a summary form. And then we're going to finish by looking at pictures from some of these clusters, like the picture you see on the screen now. And that's a <clears throat> resting site from M13. And it's at the very top of one of the mountains in Tost. And uh, th this is from, I think, the fall of 2017. And I remember when I fo uh, followed him, I was up on this mountaintop twice. And he, so in that month, he went up on this mountaintop and rested up on that mountaintop two times. And this is um, in the very eastern part of, of the study area. So, and you're looking more or less straight west. So the true toss or the, 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 the study areas were looking right into it in, on the picture there. And um, we will get to this, but often they take the day rest up high. So it's, it's a lot of work to, um, you know, climb up these mountains. And, uh, but when you get up there, you're rewarded with often fantastic views, but we'll get back to that. 
Okay, I told you that for uh, carnivores, the main thing that people have looked at for cluster studies is predation patterns. And that's true also for us. Um, that was the main reason we started using this uh, technique or this methodology. And um, especially Urian, um, when he did his PhD, predation was an important aspect of his PhD work. <clears throat> and his, um, some of his findings are summarized at the paper at the bottom there. That was one of Urian's uh, PhD papers. And it is Urian that you see on the picture here. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how well you see it, but there's an Ibex here, a big Ibex male that had been killed by one of our snow leopards. And we'll get to that when we look at the pictures too, but this is actually a quite typical place. It's at the very bottom of a drainage here. Okay, so uh, uh, Urian, of course, found a lot of things in, in, in these papers, but I'm just gonna pick a few uh, what I think are highlights. So in this paper, we, we found that they have uh, a high kill rate and a much higher kill rate than previous estimate. And that kill rate was one large prey every eight days. Uh, so one large prey a week, you could say. <clears throat> and why do I say large prey? And what do I mean by large prey? Well, first, by large prey, I mean either the two wild species that we have there, ibex, the most common prey, or uh, argali. Then you have domestic prey as well, so goat and sheep, camels and horses. Uh, and why only large prey? Because with this technique, we will not find the small prey. We will not, if, if the snow leopard kill a hare or a bird or in places where they have marmots, if they kill marmots, we don't have marmots where we work, but if they kill smaller prey, they will eat it so fast. So there will not be a clustering in position. They will be finished at um, prey before there's another GPS location taken. So <clears throat> with this technique, um, at least at the positioning rate we have, we can only find large prey. Now, um, th there's been the scat studies done in, in the Toss Mountains and uh, about 95% of the prey are, are these large prey species. So the two wild species, Ibex and Argali, and the domestic species, um, goats, sheep, camels and horses. So we're looking at the majority of the prey here. Um, another question you might ask why why, why did we find a higher kill rate than previous estimates? I think it's a, a methodological thing and not that kill rate is specifically high here, but you know, we're, we're following individual animals and we're likely following, we may also miss the odd prey, but we're likely following, uh, sorry, likely finding most of the prey. Whereas other estimates are more, I'm not sure if I should say theoretical, but they're they're backtracking, you know, given the energetic needs of the, of the snow leopards and giving them, uh, composition of the diet, you can backtrack. What should that mean then, uh, as far as how many animals um, they need they need to kill? And if you backtrack like that, there's quite a few assumptions. Things like how much of the prey are they actually uh, finishing? How much are they consuming before they leave? Um, how 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 big? Let's say we find that they kill mostly ibex. Well, if we use a male ibex, the energetic content of a male ibex, that's going to be a lot higher than than uh, female ibex. So there's a lot of assumptions. So I think it's a technical thing. Uh, so our estimates are likely relatively representative, we think, for other areas as well. Also, as quickly here, so one big prey every eight days or one prey a week, that means about 3.2, uh, I remember it, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, digit, but uh, 3.2 um, large K, uh, prey a month or about 45 large prey a year. That's roughly what a snow leopard will, um, will eat. Um, another thing that we found in, in this study is that males kill more livestock than females. And you all know that uh, livestock depredation is uh, the largest threat to snow leopards because that results in, or can result in um, retaliatory killing, you know, um, so it's uh, for the snow leopard, not a good thing to be involved in. And males killing more livestock than females probably means then that males are more at risk of uh, for retaliatory killing than females. And why, why, why may males kill more livestock than females? Well, it's something that's been seen in other cats too, lynx for sure. And I think it's been seen also in cougars and in uh, common leopards. And um, the mo what most people are 
hypothesizing is that the males are a little bit more bold, or if you turn it around that the females often have um, young, they're a little bit more careful. So somehow the, it appears as the animals can feel that it's a bit more risky feeding on livestock and likely because the, the livestock are either closer to people or there are people around. Um, but that, those are some of the findings from Urian's uh, study and examples of what you can uh, learn from cluster studies. Uh, we also have a, a paper that's in review now, and, and I think and hope it's going to be out relatively soon. Uh, that's looking at what are the animals doing when they are at the kill. So Urian looked at what are they killing and how, how uh, what type of animals are they killing and how frequent are they killing. In this paper, it's a paper that's led by Amy Italian. We're looking at um, so what do they do when, when they're at the kill site? How long do they stay at the kills? How far do they go from the kills? These type of things. And what we found here is that they stay at these large kill at the angulates for about three, uh, three and a half uh, days on average, say three to four days on average. But for some of the really large prey, like a male ibex, a horse or a camel, they can stay up for 11 days. The other thing I think um, um, a lot of you know that when the snow leopards are quite interesting that they more or less do not move away from the kills. They more or less sit right on top of it. Of course, they, occasionally they will move and okay, up to 50 meters, not unusual, but rarely do they move more than 100 meters or so. They're almost always right there. And the reason for this, we think, is there's a lot of scavengers in the area. If you move, you will you will um, uh, probably lose a lot to scavengers. And snow leopards are big enough that there are not too many dangerous things there. Uh, I worked with lynx before. They go back and forth a lot. Uh, where lynx live, there are often bigger animals. They're dangerous to the lynx. So for the lynx, it would be risky to stay right at the kill. But for a snow leopard, they're big enough that they can probably defend the kill against pretty much everything. Another thing that I think is very interesting is that I just told you that they kill on average one large prey every eight days and they're staying there for almost four days. So that means that half of their time, or you can even say half of their life, they're almost, or they're gonna be more or less almost on top of, 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 of the kill. So they spend a lot of time at, at these sites. Of course, making them vulnerable. Um, now the, the, the places where they kill their animals move around, but they are very much, um, at, at the kill sites, uh, much of their life is uh, spent at, at these kills. Um, okay. They also stay longer at wild prey than they stay at domestic prey. And this is after correcting for um, weight differences. So per kilogram, they will stay longer at the wild prey than at the domestic prey. And why, why may that be? And here, I think it's the same thing that they can feel that it's, perhaps more risk or more disturbance or more people around the domestic animals, making them stay shorter uh, at, at the domestic uh, prey than they do at the wild prey. <clears throat> Could also be related to where in space they are uh, located. Domestic prey tend to be in flatter areas. So it could be that the snow leopards don't feel as safe there. But we, we think that the main reason is probably uh, some type of, they, they can associate the domestic prey with some type of uh, threat or disturbance. So those are a few other examples of what you can learn from cluster studies and what we have found. Now we're going to switch into denning behaviors. And uh, Steve was telling you that we have had um, fifth or have or have had 15 uh, females collared. And um, Finding the dens is very, very difficult and it's a slow process because um, so out of this 15, we have located um, six or possibly seven. I actually can't remember what the sample size is uh, dens um, and documented how they move around these dens. So it's a slow process. And what I'm going to share with you here is um, uh, based on a small sample size. So we could say preliminary data, <clears throat> still some, I think, very interesting results. Um, the first one being how long are they staying at the dens? Well, on average, they stay at the dens for about a month and a half, and then they're moving. Um, and <clears throat> actually, I'm going to 
put the next slide on here. This is a slide of Agnes and her cubs. The cubs are very, very small, as you can see, but they're about two months old there. So when they're born, they can't move. During the first uh, month, they actually don't move at all. So that they're staying for a month and a half, I mean, it's related to, to the cubs uh, not um, being able to move by themselves. But when, when they're starting to be able to move, they, with these little legs, you're not going to go very far. So uh, even after when they move away from the dance, after about a month and a half, they take often a secondary tertiary dance or um, um, sites where, they, where the female basically stashes her cubs, walks away by herself, then come back and stashes, it, um, stashes them again uh, at the new place. And so on average, they stay at the dance for about a month and a half. The range here was 21 to 61 days. So 21 days is very, very small. The cubs actually can't even walk by themselves there. <clears throat> that was, uh, the female was um, very likely disturbed by something and moved the cubs. And she was actually um, moving the cubs, not the cubs walking by themselves. And in that case, we know that she stayed, you know, up until they were about a month and a half to that secondary then. So they, they, you know, it's partly um, depending on the cubs being so small, of course. Uh, so when they move, as I said, they will um, yes walk short distances. They will um, find a secure place. The female will make her own loops, where maybe make another kill, go back and get the cubs and go there again. That's something we definitely know is happening, and we've seen that from. Um, from from females with young that they often go back to the previous cluster. We never see that for males and we never see that for um, um, for um, uh, females without young. So we don't have any hardcore data because we don't have the cubs uh, colors. We don't know where the cubs are, but it, it, we have indirect evidence that it's, it's happened very frequent in the beginning that the female is going back and forth to the previous clusters. And the only reason we can see for that is that they're stashing the cubs. Um, which makes sense because they're so small and um, um, cannot walk very, very far. <clears throat> but we also see now from, from the clusters that they appear to do this stashing of the cubs at least for five to six months. And uh, I'm going to show you at the very, very end, uh, we have evidence of this also uh, up to on when the cubs are almost a year old. So uh, it seems um, that they definitely um, the females and, and the cubs are not always together, um, but the female does stash the cub, walks around, find a good place to stash them again, and then goes go and get them. That's uh, indirect evidence of that. So that, that's some of the um, denning behaviors that we are, have learned and are learning. Uh, then also we're going to look a little bit at the resting behaviors. And here I have to admit that this is something that we more or less by accident uh, started to look at. Uh, I told you we're looking, we have looked most at um, predation uh, behaviors, some uh, predation patterns. And um, so normally we take one position every five hours and that we think is enough to find most of the big praise, but we, we do worry that if they stay very short, maybe we're missing it. So what we are, have also started to do what we call intensive program, where we take one position every hour. And the main reason to do this was to check that we didn't miss any prey. So uh, we, we have this period of intensive uh, programming go back and it turns out that it doesn't look like we're missing many of the big prey. But what we found when we did that was that we found a lot more of the rest sites. And in the beginning, we saw that most less an annoyance because, okay, this picture here, <clears throat> the, the black arrow there is one of uh, a day rest for one of the, the, of the cats. And I remember this particular one. And I remember I, I was on this mountainside for three hours and I still didn't manage to get more than within 10 meters of it. I walked up somewhere here, almost all the way up, couldn't get there, walked down here, walked around up some of these uh, ravines here, came around from the top and I got to within 10 meters. So I'm pretty sure I, I could see the site and I could see that it was not a killer, but I couldn't get there. So we found it quite annoying in the beginning that a lot of our time we spent, or as we saw it then, we wasted on these rest sites. But then we realized that this is actually quite interesting. And maybe by looking at both the places where they make their kills and also the places where they take the rest, maybe we can start to get to these important questions of why are the snow leopards tied to the mountains? Why are they only in the mountains? Is it because that's the only place where they are able to kill their prey? Or is it because 
that's the only place where they can find safe resting uh, places. We don't know that, or maybe it's a combination, but by looking at resting sites as well as kill site, we can at least start to get to this very interesting question, I think. Um, so uh, tri tricky often to get to the resting sites. And um, here I'm just going to show these are all very, very preliminary data, uh, something that we have started recently. With. So there are no papers or anything on this. Uh, as, um, but definitely quite clear from, uh, we have probably visited over, over probably somewhere between 100 and 200 rest sites already. Sorry. So we're starting to um, learn quite a bit about them. and. If there's anything that's clear, that is that the day rest are often very high up, like on the picture here, uh, on high on the mountainside and actually not uncommon at the very, very top of the mountain as well. And that makes sense, you know, they, when they take the day rest, they stay for the whole, whole day. They probably want to be somewhere safe. They are definitely safer higher up and also somewhere where they can see far, so they can look out either for threats or, or, or perhaps uh, prey. During night, they tend to stop for shorter periods, and the, uh, the night rest, um, as we will see on some of the pictures later, are um, seldom high, or they're more spread out, quite often lower down um, in the mountains. So in general, it appears that the day rest are high up and the, the night rest tend to be lower. Okay. Um, <laughs> some evidence of what we call uh, uh, passive hunting or hunting passively. It's a term that we came up with ourselves, so definitely not a concept yet. But um, what we mean with this is that it ap appears as when they are resting, they are probably also looking for prey at the same time, L you know, lying there looking and listening. And if they see something, they will probably try it, you know, being somewhat opportunistic. And uh, how, how, how we come to this conclusion? Because it seems like a lot of the kills are very close to where they just had their rest sites. And when I worked with Lynx, it was the same thing there. We, we saw that a lot of the kills that we found from the Lynx was just after they had taken a rest. And when they are resting, uh, we're speculating then that you know they 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 watch or they see and they listen and if they see a, 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 an ibex or something walk right by well they're probably going to try and, and and make an attempt at it that's what we're thinking and we have called this hunting passively or passive hunting for now or being opportunistic and and looking for for prey that's something so this is uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, speculative, but it's an hypothesis that we have, we're, we're working um, along. Okay, and maybe more fun parts now, and I'm gonna look at slides um, and pictures from some of the <clears throat> clusters, which I think will um, help you understand quite a bit. And for those of you that have been at um, kill site in other places, it can be quite interesting to compare. So we're going to start to look at some of the kill sites then. Uh, this is an Ibex kill where Anu, one of our super uh, moms that we've followed for a long time, where uh, Anu and her cubs spent a day and a half. And this is actually a very, very big male Ibex. And I told you just before that they, they stay three to four days. And on the big kills, they tend to stay even longer. So you might say, well, isn't that very short? And did they get disturbed here? <clears throat> and no. But a female with cubs, in this case, she had two cubs. There's actually three uh, snow leopards here. They will, of course, consume that kill a lot faster than what a single snow leopard will, will do. So females with cubs are definitely feeding, uh, finishing the prey a lot faster than, than the other categories of cats. I'm not sure if I told you that Ibex is the main, main prey here, but it is. There are two uh, wild um, species of prey. Ibex and Argali, and then there are our uh, livestock, of course, and uh, they, about two thirds of, of their uh, food is um, wild prey, and of that by far the most uh, common is uh, Ibex. Ibex is the most common prey. Then about one third are livestock, and they're the most common one are goats, but they also kill horses, uh, camels, and, and sheep. What you see here is a very typical kill site for an ibex. It's um, like I said on the picture of Arian there at the very bottom of a drainage. 
we look at, looked at this um, earlier this summer and 62% of our uh, IBEX kills are at the bottom drainages, just like this one here. Uh, why is that? Well, um, from some of the evidence we have seen and some of the film clips that you can see on the internet, it seems like they're always, the hunts almost always are downhill. So we think that, you know, both for the snow leopards and, and the ibex, when they're running downhill, they can keep a lot of speed and the momentum. Then when they come down at the bottom here, we are speculating in that it will mean that the ibex has to adjust a little bit. Either it's going to continue and then go uphill, or it's going to be uh, making a turn and run along, uh, along the drainage. And that little adjustment, we think, might be enough for the snow leopard to catch up. Or perhaps it's even that they are coming down the hill, the ibex has to take one or two steps to adjust and now start to go up on the other side. And that's when the, the snow leopard might, might kill it here. Um, are they dragging the kill, kills? We don't see much evidence of it. It is difficult to see drag marks here. You know, if we were in an area with a lot of snow, we would see drag marks a lot more. But we don't, uh, from what we can say, it doesn't appear that they're dragging the, the kills a lot. So, uh, it appears as most of the killing is happening right down at the, uh, the, the low, li low lines like this. One more example of how it might look at, at the kill site. Um, also, this is a very typical um, um, uh, kill site, I would say. This is now F10, and uh, she also had two cubs, and they spent a day and a half here. If I remember, I think this was a female uh, Ibex here. Uh, so also finish that one relatively quick. And again, here you can see the kill site at, along this drainage area, very, very typical. This site might be maybe not so typical as far as uh, ruggedness. In general, Ibex tend to be in more rugged terrain. If I would have seen a picture here, I would have guessed when, when I was approaching that it would be in, in uh, Argali, because Argali tend to be in this more rolly area. But of course, the uh, Ibex and, and, and the Argali are overlapping to some extent. So another example of a, a typical kill site uh, for, for an Ibex. Uh, so those are some of the typical kill sites. Um, something um, that's quite interesting is, of course, you never know what it is. Of course, well, we're also guessing. Uh, we have our little guessing games what it's going to be. But some things that we never guessed and we did not expect to see was uh, previously undocumented prey. In this case here, it's a gazelle. And this is a male gazelle. Um, that hasn't been described as a, as a prey for, for snow leopards before. And we have now found three gazelles killed by, by snow leopards, two of them by a female, and that was back in 2018. And we're thinking, well, maybe she has figured something out that the others don't know. But when we're back again this spring, we, M20 also killed a gazelle. So now we're starting to see it also, uh, or not just uh, one snow leopard. And uh, maybe this is something that has happened you know, for a long, long time that occasionally they, they, they kill um, uh, something rare. And to find something rare, you have to have a big sample size. And I think we're now at least 350. We might have be at about 400 kill sites. So um, it takes uh, a lot of data before you see these rare things. It could also be that all of a sudden the gazelles are more common inside the mountains. And um, the local people we're talking to are saying that they, they tend to see more gazelles in, in the mountains now. Gazelles otherwise are a typical steppe species, so they're outside of the mountains. But maybe there's something happening <clears throat> out on the, on the mountains, or sorry, out on the steppes. They're forcing the gazelles to move further in, into the mountains. Uh, maybe more people, maybe less uh, uh, grazing, more, more disturbance, forcing the gazelles into the mountain. Uh, sort of giving another opportunity for, for the snow leopards uh, to expand uh, their diets. Um, yeah. Okay, well, that's enough of looking at dead animals. Now we're going to switch to look at how it, uh, how it looks where they're taking their rest sites. And I'm going to start with what I think is a very majestic resting site. This is a resting site uh, by M12. <clears throat> he was resting right here where, uh, where Ghana is sitting, very top of the mountain, fantastic view, and uh, of course, a very safe place to rest. If there is any activity, it's going to be down uh, at, at this valley here. There might be a herder or, or two at the most walking through with their herds uh, in one day, maybe one or two motorcycles. And almost all the human activity is going to be down at, at, at the valley. Same. 
uh, wolves would be the main uh, natural enemy. They would tend to be further down. <clears throat> so very safe place. Uh, and like I said, most of the rest, they rest are up high. They're safe there, uh, but they can also uh, uh, look for prey here, we think. So uh, if, if he's here, and below him, there's going to be a, a group of ibex walk by. Well, likely he might make an attempt to it, and that's what I then call passive hunting. But uh, quite spectacular uh, places. Uh, a lot of work to get to the, these mountain tops, uh, but you're rewarded with a fantastic view when you get up. One more example of a, a day rest. This is also a day rest by um, M12, where he spent the light hours of the day on, uh, on this little ledge or shelf here. Also, as is, you can see, quite high up. This is not the very top of the mountain, but it's high up. Uh, if there is any activity, same thing here, it would be, be down. Uh, sorry, if there's any human activity, same thing here would be down in the valley here. And uh, if there's uh, any movement of people uh, or so, that's not going to bother Snow Leopard at all. He's just going to be there, hunker down. Often when we travel in here, we're, there are often Snow Leopards probably looking at us. I've never seen a Snow Leopard except for when we have caught them. Um, but maybe I'm just so focused on driving my motorcycle, I'm not looking up the, 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 the mountains. But uh, another example then of uh, a typical uh, day rest, up high um, during the day. Here is one example also by M12, <clears throat> and this is a night rest. He spent only one hour here. Um, and I think it's just like us. You're, if, if you're going to stop just for a short time, you're not going to be as picky and you're not going to put as much effort to find a safe place as possible. You're probably just going to take maybe not the first best one, but one of the first best ones because you're not going to be staying there for that long. And this was also, <clears throat> sorry, this was also when we were uh, monitoring the, the snow leopard intensively, taking one position every hour. And I remember that in this case, there was one position higher up in this drainage and one further down. So he was probably just walking down this drainage, decided, okay, I'm going to lay down for a bit and then continue. And then he has to go, oh, there's some nice high grass there. I'm, I'm a bit protected there. I'm just going to lay down there. And when we go to this um, rest sites too, uh, often if it's in grass here, you're going to see it's matted down. And often you can see little white thin hair. So we can actually say, yes, this is exactly where it is. And with, with a GPS, we're going to get in with plus minus five meters. So we're getting very, very close. Um, so that's, I would say, a relatively typical uh, night rest uh, where they then stop shorter. Uh, we're going to look at two more night rests. This one was quite interesting. Um, this is a place, so you have a cliff here. This cliff is about 30 meters high, so it's quite high and more or less a sheer cliff. Um, and then we have two cats that have rested below here. I was here in, in the winter of uh, 2019 and M13 had, took his rest site here. The next winter I was back again. And when I got to the place, I was like, this is awful, awfully familiar. Um, so then when I came back uh, to camp, I just checked, have I been there before? And yes, then there was like a few meters away from where M13 had rested one year earlier. So this is likely a, a, a place where they, for them is attractive for taking the night rest. And I'm thinking that, the, you know, the cliff behind them, that's going to give them protection for at least, you know, 50% um, of, of, of the, the, the different sides. Um, no relationship between these cats that we know of. So it's not that one of them, uh, you know, uh, M13 was a young of F14 or something like that. Not that we know of anyways, but probably just a good site that, you know, is attractive to, to cats in general. Then. And last example when it comes to resting sites it's um is this one and it's similar this is a, re a night rest where f15 or presnell as we call her as well uh, f15 and her cubs they spent a few hours here in the fall of 2022 and then uh, so amy and i were here and it's actually a very difficult place to to get to the only place we could get here was through this little gut here and we had to walk around here and come down in a little cut and around here. And uh, so it's, it's almost like um, two amphitheaters of, of, of cliffs and she's uh, selected to the lower one there. So uh, very protected and the cubs are gonna be very protected here as well. Then when we're back this spring, I, we had a position actually at exactly the same place. And um, 
um, uh, back here again. And now, okay, in the fall 20, uh, they were about um, four or five months old. Then uh, we're back in the spring again, they're about a year old um, um, using these safe places. Okay, so I've talked for quite a while and we have only have one more slide now and it's gonna be the last one. And this is, I think the most interesting cluster that I have been or the two most interesting clusters that I've been at. And uh, this is from this spring. And this is also F15 or Presnell. And uh, this is a rest site and a kill site about one kilometer away. And why I think this is so interesting is that uh, with with this one and you know with the details of how she moved between these places that i'm going to share with you soon we can see some evidence of um, f15 stashing her cubs uh, and now and when the cubs are as old as one year old they're almost or they're 10 months old but they're very old there's still evidence of her stashing them at this age and then um, also um, evidence of her uh, hunting passively or you know hunting or uh, while 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 resting, so uh, I know I'm uh, going over the time perhaps a little bit, but I'm going to share this um, what happened here with you anyway. So um, F15 got here uh, right before it was getting light, um, presumably with her cubs, lay down here for a few hours. Uh, sort of mid morning, uh, she leaves this one here, goes across this valley. It's about 500 meters wide, so it's quite wide. Very rarely will they cross a big valley like that in, in, in daylight. And then uh, went over, killed an Argali here, uh, spent a few hours at the kill site. And then they still during uh, early, early afternoon, still uh, bright daylight, she crossed this valley again, which is unusual that they do during the day, came back here, spent the rest of the day, and then again walked down here when it got dark. Now, if this would have been, uh, 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 um, or most other snow leopards would, if they did, first, I don't think they would uh, cross, they, unusually they cross a big valley like this during the day. But if they made a kill down there, they would extremely, would be extremely unlikely that it would cross the valley again. If they feel a little bit exposed here, they might walk up a, on one of these smaller uh, um, hills here and take a day rest there just to be safe up high. So uh, we think that the only reason that she would cross uh, this big valley again, go up there and spend the rest of the day, is that she had stashed the cubs there and there. Uh, we don't see, like I said, we never see any other group of snow leopards going back to a previous cluster. It doesn't really make sense. She's exposing herself by crossing this here. And why go extra and then go back again? Why not just stay uh, at the most safe place down here? So we, we, we take that as evidence of that she's still stashing the cubs. Um, when they're 10 to 11 months old. And the reason we probably haven't seen this before that is that we have used too long intervals between, between the positions. And the other thing, uh, we think that she has saw the, the Ibex uh, from up, uh, sorry, the Argali from up here, uh, the, that she would leave during the middle of the day across that big of a valley, unlikely. So she probably saw this group of Argali and then said, well, it's worth taking the risk and then went over and, and killed them. Okay, I've talked for quite a while. So uh, I'm just gonna sum it up. Uh, clusters then, they, what clusters are, are just simply a methodological thing. It's places that collared animals stop and return to. So it's, you have to have a collar on the animal to, to be able to use the technique. And it's a, it's a technical thing. But we can use this then to look at uh, different behaviors like predation behaviors, reproductive behaviors and resting behaviors. And with that, uh, thank you. And sorry if I talked a little bit longer than I should have. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And thank you. And, and now uh, discussions and, and questions. Oh, well, we, we have we have Jan Lind to uh, speak first, I think. We should get him. Gustav, you, that was really very, very nice. There was just so many questions. We're just going to come to most of them, uh, some of those which I think we can answer. We'll try to answer within the chat as well but yes over to you Yonlin, and then we'll come back to questions yeah sure uh thanks um so i see a lot of questions coming up uh, for gustav so i just uh catch the chance to introduce a little bit of snow leopard coloring work in china um so we start the snow leopard coloring more or less, it's about two or three years uh, later than the the, the toss mountain projects uh, we captured the first two 
snow leopards in uh, two, uh, 2012. But uh, unluckily, that project uh, didn't continue uh, after one month, uh, two or one year. So, uh, and, and finally, uh, two years ago, we restart the, the snow level covering project. And now there are about uh, uh, seven individuals uh, around the Chilean mountains uh, we, we, we call it, we have with colors. Uh, but uh, compared to, to the, the Tosla projects, uh, these individuals are scattered along 800 kilometers apart mountains. So it's not a, a capture in one site. So that make uh, uh, made a lot, a lot more challenges to uh, follow the, the, the clusters. Um, but uh, some uh, field surveys so that uh, uh, they, they hunt successfully and there's sometimes across the villages and get close to the, the, the city towns. That's quite interesting. Um, and I, I see the one question about the, the small uh, place. Um, I have a little bit appearance on the bear calling uh, because they hunt marmots. So the bears spend a lot of time digging for marmots. So it could show the, uh, 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 the clusters uh, from the, the, the color data. But for snow leopard, I think it's quite hard to identify uh, a small place. So uh, that's a, 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 bit, a bit information. So I, I think we should leave time for questions to Gustav. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to make one comment. It's it's interesting, you know, with with the Mormon, we don't have them, but I think it's it's difficult. Maybe you know, if they stopped and hunted for a long time, like the bears, but the snow leopards, if they catch one, we, you know, we've seen pictures from uh, Kyrgyzstan where they're actually carrying them away. So it, yeah, it would be. The, the super hard to detect with clusters, but maybe that's, you know, that's why I think, you know, you can use different techniques, uh, maybe use uh, scat studies or something to, to get to these. Um, that could maybe be one one thing. And and also, yes, one comment. Yeah, I I've maybe should have stressed that we are lucky in, in that sense that we can actually, you know, we can travel relatively easy in our study area compared to most other snow leopard snow leopard uh, field size, like you said, you could not use a motorcycle and, and go from one, one, one side of the study area to us. Of course, we have to walk in the end, but uh, yeah, we're lucky that way. Thank you. Thanks, Yandin. And that really helps. Uh, okay, now, shall we get to the questions? We have lots of them, Gustav, so you might be spending quite some time here. But, yeah. um, maybe okay. also because we can do like you you pick some of them and then okay. uh, we will we will if we can somehow save them and we can try them and, and for sure and, yeah, for sure yeah. Yeah. yeah some of them I've tried to answer in the chat window itself but the rest I think it'll be really useful to have you answer some of them um, I think we have a question from Philippe do they kill more males than female ibex or argali. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a lot of information and Urian is working on one of them. Uh, you can almost say it's a leftover from, from Urian's PhD or a continuation from his PhD. And uh, uh, yes, uh, they, it, it seems like they are selecting the male Ibex. Uh, if I can, uh, um, throughout most of the year, there, there's, uh, it appears as they're selecting male Ibex. We think it's almost, you know, like these birds with the long tails that maybe the male Ibex are getting too large for themselves. Uh, so they're, they're slower. When you see a big male Ibex on things, they can almost look clumsy. That's what we're speculating. But uh, I think it's early spring, uh, they tend to, to kill female uh, Ibex. And Again, this is all speculation. We think maybe when they are just before giving birth, either they're more attracted to the snow leopards or they're a little bit less agile. We don't know that. But yeah, good question, Philip. Uh, uh, so in, in general, more male ibex. Um, Yuli is asking, hunting passively, do you know whether or when there is a potential prey in the surroundings? Uh, um, yeah, I'm, if I understand the question is how uh, is it how they know it with, okay, uh, they use ears a lot and uh, where we are, it's very dry and gravelly. Um, I mean, it's almost impossible to sneak. So even, you know, uh, an Ibex are super adaptive, a little, some little gravel falling out either, or of, of course, seeing them as by eye, that's what we think they do. Uh, so, you know, uh, um, yeah, and maybe it's not the right word hunting possibly, but you know, maybe it's just being opportunistic, but uh, yeah, yeah. 
That's great. Sagnik has an interesting question about site fidelity for resting. Yeah. Uh, any, any, it, it, I mean, it's something that we've discussed, which is like a, a mansion of yours. You, you have multiple yeah. uh, real estate out there. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's one of these things that, uh, I, okay, uh, so far it's mostly anecdotal, but I know th there's, um, you know, two handfuls of, of places where I know I've been at the exact same place and uh, I take a lot of photographs and when I come home I little, put little arrows so I can remember where they were and <clears throat> uh, and I know for sure I've been probably to about 10 uh, places where the same individual has come back uh, either uh, within that same month and uh, we, we do usually one month of intensive uh, studies or even a year later so I'm sure that they have uh, certain preferred places but we 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 don't have enough data uh, that, that's yeah yeah and um, we will start with just describing where to take the rest but i i'm sure like you say there are certain places that are preferred and it could be either by by learning and that i learn it myself i learn it from my mom or maybe it's just like okay these sites for some for some reason are attractive sites in general i don't even have to learn it it just uh, makes me makes me feel safe or uh, Teresa is asking whether there's a uh, whether you find any small prey on the resting sites or the small clusters. Yeah, it's a very good, very good question. And you know, like I said, the reason we started doing this is: <clears throat> do we miss any of the big prey? And of course, do we find some small preys? And I, I found chucker feathers on uh, only the ones where we have one hour in between. So yes, there are definitely killing chuckers. Uh, what? Um, there are some chuckers I remember, but um, there are some other small prey. So yeah, of course there are, are killing small prey as well. Um, again, Yuli was asking about climatic factors and their influence on the choice of resting sites. Very good. I think on on any of the behaviors, something we're we're hoping to uh, to do learn more of. We we could say that we are uh, installing a, a weather station. Yes, to the first stage. Yes, in general, do we see any 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 uh, I guess behaviors or or a space use uh, related to to um, to uh, um, weather factors like during extremely hot days or extremely cold days uh, or extremely windy days, do we see any differences? That's that's where we're gonna start at. But uh, also for resting sites, you know, uh, very hot days, probably, I'm mean, speculating in a shady place, maybe, um, um, or um, very windy day, maybe, you know, downwind. Uh, but yeah, super interesting questions and, and, and good questions. Yeah. And that you know, re related then to climate change, which is probably, Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's the next thing our team's working on. Uh, okay, Khalil has some very interesting, but quite a few questions. I'm going to pick one of them and the rest I'm sure we should be able to answer to him separately. Uh, the one I'll pick up is the one of wolves. Do wolves grab the kill? Good questions. Uh, we have wolves in, in the area. And uh, if it's, uh, um, what do you call it, a flock or is it a group of wolves? <laughs> Sorry, I lost the question. <laughs> uh, they, they can probably... Uh, Right? Pack. Pack, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I lost the word. So a pack of wolves, they can probably drive the, the snow leopards away. I I, I think uh, there are people here that would know more about that that have where wolves are more common. Uh, uh, yeah. It, one thing actually, we don't, you know, okay, when we, when, the way we do it, we, we, we get the positions, we look where they are at, we make sure that they move. Uh, so is it a female with young, we actually give them extra time to, to make sure that they move. So when we come in, it's almost always, okay, we have a, one of, on our form, uh, proportion remaining, it's always zero or proportion consumed, it's always 100. But we don't know, maybe there has been wolves. Uh, uh, if there was snow, we could probably see more wolf tracks uh, after. But uh, so we we actually don't have a good good handle of this. Um, um, yeah, I, I I can't give a good answer. I'm sure it's happening. Um, but uh. oh, that's fine. Thanks, Gustav. Uh, th there's another interesting question, and I think this is a critical one, especially since <coughs> some of these individuals are being followed uh, on foot as well. Is about the denning sites. Um, and Teresa is asking, when would you check the den sites? Um, yeah. And would the females move the kittens after you were there, or you would always visit them after the females had already left? 
I think that's yeah. a critical one. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, we, we, we have, I think we have visited five or six events. Uh, like I said, the, the, the number, uh, you know, whether we visit them, whether we actually detected it, whether we found the dance. So the, the sample size here depends on what you're asking, but I think it's five dance or six, dance, five, five dance that we have visited. And we, we have said, we will only give, give it one try. Uh, if, if we don't find it that time, we, we stop it. So there are a few cases where we actually fail. We, we, we could not find it. And so we, uh, we just said, okay, that's it. That was the one time we, we tried it. Uh, we wait until they're at least uh, two weeks old, uh, preferably uh, between two weeks and four weeks. Uh, we were in one time, they were one month old. They still could not move, but um, uh, they were um, almost starting to crawl. They were actually weren't even crawling at, at four weeks of age. Um, but yes, so in those cases we have we have gone in, but we do it once, and we we um, um, only we have the, the the collar has a VHF part of it. So um, when the female leaves, we go in. Uh, we have one somebody uh, listening with the VHF all the time. We th that one case that it did move that was actually after we were in, and she did move. We we have um, and the other times they have not moved. Uh, moving. Uh, 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 I think can happen anyways. Uh, of course, that, that, that was caused by us. She moved uh, a couple of hundred meters and into uh, another cave. Uh, I've worked with Arctic foxes. They move the pups all the time. Uh, I don't, it's not as common with snow leopards. So um, it, it, yeah, it's um, some, something to be uh, concerned of for sure. Um, um, yeah. I'm not sure if the, I answered all of those questions there. That, that was good, Gustav. Uh, but I, I do have a, uh, uh, a, a bigger question from Dr. Chandavat, who's asking, how do you explain snow leopard biomass consumption in a year uh, if you're comparing it uh, with that of the tiger? Uh, maybe it might be useful if we can mention or, or if we can look at the two as a reference, uh, but it looks like uh, if you're comparing it with the tiger, the snow leopard's consumption seems to be on the higher side if I'm not misunderstanding the question here. Is it how much they're feeding on? Like what, what proportion the carcass? Yeah, yeah. like I said, oh, we-, oh, we, we oh, oh, Overall, Gustav, so in a year, X kilograms of meat ah. is what a tiger's eating per unit body mass versus what the snow leopard is using, consuming per unit body mass. Yeah, it would be interesting to know also what, what, how much do they actually spend? You know, if you live in a mountain area, so you walk up and down a lot, but maybe, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a tiger jumps up and down as well. I, yeah. So what are the intake and what's, what, what are, is actually the energetic use or how much do they use? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Uh, okay. It's a, a slightly technical question from Sharon about the accuracy of the GPS locations. Uh, how accurate these have been. I think uh, that's uh, something you can respond since you physically visit some of these locations and you will have a much better understanding then. Yeah, um, it, it's in general super very, very high, plus minus five meters. We do get the odd uh, weird location. Um, not sure actually if that, it, it, um, I would say it would be at least less than one in 100. That sometimes we're like, re did I really go there? And uh, we, we don't have a chance to check it either. And if we had snow, we could do a lot. We could check it more, you know, uh, you know, follow the track. Did they actually, between these positions, did they go there? But in general, the, the um, um, accuracy is very, very high. Yeah. Thank you. You can get some bouncing perhaps, but yeah. So. Yeah, the, there's a comment from uh, Dr. Chundavad, which is that in his study, he found more than one resting places in an area, and men, most of them depended on, well, they usually were the ones that were avoiding direct sunlight. So okay. Most of the times it was where it was avoiding the sun. Yeah, yeah. I think it varies, you know, in, in summer, I'm sure they're uh, selecting places where they yeah. can get cool. Also, I should say, you know, uh, Seems like when we go to a mountaintop, uh, there can be two mini clusters up there. My, one might be in the shadow, in the shade, and like one it. might be up high. And if that is yeah. to um, sort of regulate the temperature or a response to the temperature, or if it's, you know, okay, I, I feel like I need to see further now, I don't know. But yeah, there within a cluster, there can be mini clusters as well. So they, they uh -huh. on top of these little mountains, uh, they're, they're definitely moving around a, a little bit as well. 
Thanks, Gustav. Again, uh, uh, nice to have experts with you uh, in the meeting. So both Yanlin and uh, Raghu have responded. Yanlin says that he observed a brown bear grabbing a blue sheep kill from a snow leopard. And uh, uh, Dr. Raghu mentions that after wolves visit to the kill, one can fairly easily tell by the way they feed and scrape markings, which again, I mean, you, you guys have been trying to monitor as yeah. well. Yeah, we work with some of the local uh, uh, local rangers there with us uh, sometimes, and they are much better at this. You know, they can see the signs. Uh, I might see, okay, there's a wolf track there, but I'm not able to interpret uh, in the same way. Like we have one of our rangers, Buren, that is with us a fair bit. He's uh, very good at these things. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, we are close to the end, I would say. Um... Yeah, sorry, Raki. Uh, thanks for reminding that we're close to maybe beyond the time, I'd say. But we can we go for another five minutes if that's okay? A fascinating question. Uh, yeah, sure. It, 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 yeah. sure. Thank you, Raki. Thanks for that <laughs> that extension. Um, right. Da, 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 da. Yeah, doc, well, Dr. Chundavat is saying that twice the amount of biomass of the snow of the tigers is what snow leopards seem to be consuming. Okay. Um, Alistair Stewart has a question. Uh, I think there are two parts to his question. Let me look. Uh, rest sites remind him of where rock wallabies sit on a high rocky ledge in Australia. They often sun themselves in cool weather at these places, but also have a good visibility for seeing predators and have several escape routes. Yeah, and yeah, very similar. Effect. You know, of course, the snow yeah. leopard might be interested in eating something, but for them also, you know, okay, Go not right. getting eaten, but at least not getting hurt. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I just, you know, it's something I don't see a lot about, uh, you know, arresting behaviors. And I think it is an important aspect. Maybe for, for uh, prey animals, of course, it's even more. And, uh, you know, but uh, among uh, carnivores, it, it's not a lot of information there, but we can probably learn a lot from, from, from prey animals there, I think. So good, good point, thanks. Yeah, that should put together mm -hmm. most of the questions. Some of these we may not have been able to answer or we, uh, we may have skipped, I uh, may have skipped, but I'm sure we should be able to follow up uh, individually and respond to them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what will we call snow leopard, a small cat or a medium-sized cat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a big cat. <laughs> <laughs> big, oh, the oh, smallest yeah, of the cat. big cat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, there are some people, uh, I think, um, isn't the clouded leopard included in the big cats? Uh, at least um, systematically, I think. Um, uh, and I know Orion and I talk a lot about that. And Orion is like, no, that's not a big cat because it's uh, not bigger <laughs> than a lynx. But I think uh, systematically in that group. So, yeah, I think... Uh, and then we have medium and medium sized and medium small and uh, we can there's an answer a big appetite oh. cat may not be a big cat but a big appetite cat yeah. <laughs> given how <laughs> how much uh, they seem to be uh, hunting i was just okay. going to say like most things there are many different different definitions it depends on the definition <laughs> yes <laughs> indeed indeed uh great now let me just take this opportunity to Okay, I'm gonna put the name. Uh, yeah, let me let me be a bit biased. Uh, Dr. Raghu Chudav, can you please just you know say a couple of things uh, just to help summarize uh, this chat? I know I'm I'm just putting you on a spot, but uh, why not? Uh, it, it, yeah, it's it's been great to have uh, received your inputs as well. If you can, um, maybe no, unmute. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you, sir. Yes. No. Thanks, uh, Gustav. Uh, Gustav, it's fantastic to learn so much. Uh, um, and it really um, it was very interesting to learn about the um, the movement and the kills. Because as far as I'm concerned, I consider snow leopard as a medium-sized prey, uh, but a very unique cat, uh, which has not evolutionarily followed the size of the prey and not grown its size. It remains the same and sexual segregation is not there. And despite that, we see quite a bit of variations as Gustav was saying. So there's a lot more to learn about snow leopard. We're still just beginning uh, to do that. Uh, I say medium size basically because it's, 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 it's about 35 kg 
which is just just about uh, 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 lynx, but its ability to kill prey, which is tiger, will find difficult, which is the size of a male ibex, which is at the 20 kg, which is a male samba or a good size meal guy. Uh, um, so its its ability to do that is quite amazing, actually, and I refer snow leopard as a very unique uh, evolutionary cat. Uh, and though it's it's in panthera, but it's size-wise is one of the small, my smallest of the panthera cat. But its uh, ability is amazing. Um, so we have a lot to learn. Um, uh, it's predation, uh, and it's fascinating to see these things. Um, I still want to know, know more how, why, how can the snow leopard consume twice as much biomass having such a small body size compared to other large cats? You know, body size is about three times smaller and it's eating three times more meat or killing more than that. And how how we can explain that as a biology or ecological uh, argument. And that's something that will be very fascinating. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think maybe some uh, ecophysiology might be interesting to look at some of, of these aspects, but yeah. Because yeah. I, I, you may be correcting, you can correct me because I was looking at the movement and you were saying it that the bioenergetic, but I just remember that, you know, the distance they cover both all the cats, actually lions, tigers, um, they are same thresholds about 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers at 24 hours. Uh, so snow, tigers may not be mountain, but three times more covering the same distance, the energy law costs may be the same, uh, but it will be interesting to explore those avenues. Definitely, and, yeah. And, and, and that, that leads to something very interesting that can be explored. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Gustav, there, uh, there was the study on uh, on cougars where they uh, they made them walk on treadmills and, and tried to, ex you know, try to really decipher their uh, uh, the energy consumption and, and metabolism and other factors. And that really helped them assess the cost of uh, people taking away each kill. And, and and again, I, I mean, we we are borrowing a lot of this information about the uh, about their metabolism. It might be useful to 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 even explore some possible studies using some ex situ data coming in from zoos and other places as well. Yeah. So, but but yeah, mean, these are fascinating questions. Yeah, and as and again, also, you know, as I and sorry. Gustav, I would and maybe they can explore because they have now bet much better data. What I did Indeed. was following the same track over. Sure kilometers and now you've got thousands of locations and what what i did was that the slopes we divided into three categories relative to the ridge line so upper right. slopes middle slopes and lower slopes and most of the locations we had resting and otherwise were on the upper slopes you know and which is yeah. uh, fascinating to think that they are still there and that may be an energetic reason why a snow leopard spend more time because it's much easier for them to go down and follow the prey rather than climbing up and doing it. So there are quite a lot of things one can. And yeah, it might be interesting if you had snow to, you know, the, to get, because even if we would take um, high positioning rate, we don't know what they did in between. So yeah, there, mm -hmm. yeah, lots of interesting, there's so much we can look at, which is which is great. We're just, like you say, starting to scratch the surface scratch of the surface. surface. <laughs> yes, and, and again, I mean, that that's, that's the, that's the, fascinating part that 15 years 35 individuals almost a you know i mean hundreds of thousand, hundred thousand data points and we're still learning so great okay um i think and with that maybe we can start summarizing and we can uh, if there are no more questions and thank you uh, uh, and dr chandavat for uh, helping put it all together again Cannot thank you enough, Gustav. That was such a nice, simply done talk. You know, uh, from a five-year-old to a to an eight-year-old, everyone could have understood the way you explained everything. Thanks for doing it so. Well, that's good. Yeah, and, I remember so Justine asked me. She was saying, you know, can you talk about clusters? I'm like, what? What should I say? But she said, you have so many <laughs> pictures. You know, maybe base exactly. it on that. And you know, so it was exactly. Justine. Uh, yeah, and and then again, thank you, Yan Lin, for giving for providing perspectives, which was also fat, very very useful. Okay, great. So with that, uh, let's uh, uh, let's call this 
call it a day. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in for this talk. As I was told, this is one of the most heavily subscribed uh, webinars so far. And Gustav, you've done brilliantly. Thank you. Well, it's <laughs> thank good you. to see everyone. Yeah. But thank you so much, Gustav. Yeah. It was wonderful having you. you. Thank you. Thank you.